I'm very sad that I could not be in person, uh, but this is due to some technical difficulties. I started my trip, but it ended quickly. So today, I would like to talk to you on the topic of drug-related hypothalamic pituitary dysfunction. And I would like to talk to you about these two because some of the drugs act on the pituitary through hypothalamus, while some act directly on the pituitary. Next slide, please. So what we know today, I'm going to mention a little bit about excessive and inappropriate ADH depletion induced by drugs, which are very commonly used in our practice. Mention drug-induced autoimmune hypophysitis. You will see that there is a phase of hormone excess followed by a phase of hormone deficiency. We, are, we were not aware of this until recently. Chemotherapy and pituitary, opioids and pituitary. Next, please. So here uh, you see that this inappropriate ADA secretion has its criteria. And I will tell you that there are five criteria, amongst which this is the most important one, that is hyponatremia with corresponding hypo of malignity. And then you can continue clicking to see the five criteria. What is very important here is that there is no volume depletion and that the adrenal function is completely normal. Next slide, please. So there are five drug classes which cause this syndrome. And as you see, number one, antidepressants, which are so commonly used, anticonvulsants used in neurology, antipsychotics, cytotoxic agents, and pain medication. I will concentrate on the first two. Next slide. So the most common and the beloved antidepressants are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. We think that they are selective and that the word ideal, that does not exist in reality. So in reality, these drugs are dirty drugs and you see how many receptors they attack. We have to have in mind uh, about this, not to claim there's only the serotonin receptor which is attacked. Next slide, please. So this is a 79-year-old male. The fortunate thing is that he is the father of an endocrinologist doctor who was brought to the hospital because he lost balance and fell at home. Next slide, next please, tells us that he has been recently prescribed an SSRI because of the depression following the death of his wife, the mother of our endocrinologist. And he was brought to a neurological department and they said, could it be because he was unstable and he fell that it's a cerebellar syndrome? The biochemistry said, ooh, sodium 107. And the endocrinologist's daughter said, wow, he's taking an antidepressant. Could it be that? So he was restricted. She asked for consultation. We did fluid restriction after some investigation, and we told him that he should cope, and he was able to cope without antidepressants. I will show you, he's an elderly male, an elderly person. Take this into account when prescribing antidepressants. Next slide, please. So here we have another male. Unfortunately, uh, we have also females, but I prefer putting males on. 71-year-old man referred to hospital because of nausea, unbalance, and cognitive impairment. He was treated for neuralgia, trigeminal by neurologist, and it was a difficult uh, to treat neuralgia, and he had to use high dose of carbamazepine. The neurologist said, oh, what hyponatremia of 125, that's nothing. So I will accept that because this is an unavoidable side effect of carbamazepine. So it's either carbamazepine or oxtacarbazin, all of them cause hyponatremia. Next slide will show us, next please. When carbamazepine is essential, no, uh, yes, when carbamazepine is essential to the patient, you think his 
sodium was fluctuating between 120 and 125, he did not have acute symptoms of hyponatremia, nor severe, so the neurologist thought that was not so much important. However, he was very had to exclude adrenal insufficiency, and this man was my friend, and that's why we did all the investigation. The next slide will show you that we had to tell the neurologist this wonderful picture taken by Renneburg, which shows in the upper part of the picture, if a patient has sodium 125, this is how he walks. This is walking, uh, he, the patient walks, and you register how he walks. So you see the chaotic walk and the very imbalanced walk. And the patient is elderly and completely asymptomatic. And he has this harmful complication of treatment. It's not unharmful as the neurologists think. And then when you correct his sodium down, you see of a sodium 135, he walks nicely again. Next slide, please. So what is the mechanism, you will say, you will ask. The mechanisms can be central and peripheral. Under type A, you see an unregulated hypersecretion of vasopressin. That's a central mechanism in the hypothalamic nuclei secreting vasopressin, a little bit unregulated. Under B, you can have baseline elevated secretion vasopressin constantly. Under C, you can also centrally move your, reset your osmostat. And number five, D, you, number four, D, uh, it could be also a renal effect on the D2R receptor. So we're not certain, but we know it's drug-induced, and the drugs work centrally, but as well peripherally. Next slide, please. So strategies to improve the management of these elderly patients. We have to recognize chronic hyponatremia with subtle neurological symptoms because we think they are important and harmful. We have to analyze the predisposing factor that the dose of the drug and the age. We have to monitor that. And with number four, we use uh, treatment with fluid restriction, unlike Vaptans, because we use Vaptans only for cancer-induced uh, SIADH. Next slide, please. I will now go to pituitary and to immunology. Next slide. So this is a wonderful, a wonderful slide telling us that this is cancer immunotherapy of today, and it says it has a colorful past and a bright future. What you see on this slide is inactivated T lymphocytes in green, and in red is the tumor cells, and there is only one lymphocyte trying to touch this malignant tumor and do something about it. However, next slide. Let us look at the colorful past. The father of cancer immunotherapy is Dr. Coley. He was a bone surgeon in New York who boldly injected streptococcal organisms into inoperable cancer patients. He believed that this would cause disappearance of the tumor, and it did in one of his patients, which was the first known successful cancer immunotherapy. He made cocktails of bacteria injecting cancer patients. This he based on his own, no fact, on his own observation of the sarcoma case, which he took care of, a patient in whom tumor vanished because following a erysipela infection. So this is something we have to have in mind that it started a long time ago in the beginning of the 20th century. However, this evolved. Next slide, please. And now today, we are much, much more advanced in immunology, although I will be very critical in the end about immunology in cancer, uh, because now we know that the immune system has checkers, checkers and balances, and it needs to keep itself from not harming itself. So there are these checkpoint signaling pathways that are critical in regulating those cells called T lymphocytes, which kill everything that is foreign. Now, there are two checkpoints today which seem to be important, many of you might know. 
One is called the cytotoxic T lymphocyte associated protein 4 pathway, in short, CTLA4. And the other one is another programmed cell death 1 and programmed cell death 1 ligand checkpoint pathway, PD1 and PDL1. Next slide might explain a little bit easier to you. On the upper part of the slide, you will see what we want to do. The tumor is in red, and you see how the tumor has occupied the T lymphocytes in green, not allowing them to be active through PD-1 checkpoint and through CTLA-4 checkpoint. Now, what we want to do is to activate the T lymphocytes by antibodies uh, and not allowing tumor to uh, uh, catch these lymphocytes. And then when we activate them, we hope that the T lymphocytes activated will kill by immunological mechanism the tumor cells. However, in my title, you see what activated T lymphocytes do. If you move the checkpoint, then you cause loss of intolerance. And then the T lymphocytes set sight. They love the endocrine glands. If it's the pituitary, they cause hypophysitis. If it's the thyroid, they cause immune thyroiditis. If it's the adrenals, adrenalitis. And if it's the pancreas, type 1 diabetes. Next slide, please. So what are the approved checkpoint inhibitors today? There are many. I have listed some, which I won't read to you, maybe the most famous ipilimumab and nivolumab, but there are many others. And I think that the drug companies are now hurrying to promote many, many of these inhibitors for which I will be critical. Next slide. 32% of cancer patients develop endocrinopathies. And I put under quotation, itis. For you to remember that this is uh, itis, thyroiditis, hypophysitis, adrenalitis. And if you remember the viral infections, you will remember that the first phase of an infection is excess of hormones, and the second phase of the infection is deficiency of hormones. That is exactly what happens during autoimmune attack by the T lymphocytes. And you see that the thyroid dysfunction is more frequent, most frequent, while diabetes mellitus type 1 is the least frequent. Next slide. So the itis will result in hormone excess and hormone deficiency, and this all may start late in the course of uh, uh, immune checkpoint. It may start at eight or nine weeks of therapy. Uh, uh, you are possibly aware that a lot of uh, hypothyroidism, hypocorticism, and hypogonadism occur. Prolactin may be low. However, recently, STOLK can also be involved by autoimmune process, and the, the uh, diabetes insipidus has been documented. And next, please click, will show that hyponatremia is very frequent, 55% present with hyponatremia. Next slide, please. So a clinical case, and you have to guess, a 58-year-old woman with malignant melanoma, stage 3A, commences ipilimuma two months before presentation, presents with headache and fatigue. So for you is to find out, she has elevated free T4, low TSH, and very low cortisol. What is the diagnosis? Evie, ask the, ah, oh, no, don't click, ah, oh, back. <laughs> what is the diagnosis? Somebody from the audience maybe should tell us. Evie? Okay, let's go on, click please. So this, person has two endocrinopathies, hypophysitis causing low cortisol and thyroiditis causing elevated free thyroid hormones and low TSH related to ipilimuma. So this tells you that you can have hormonal excess or hormonal deficiency in an endocrinopathy caused by drugs. 
Next slide, please. I would also like to point to this case of transient Cushing's ACTH dependent Cushing patient published recently. So you see in the first part, the magnetic resonance of the pituitary. Then you see the enlargement of the pituitary 12 weeks after combined immunotherapy. So she had combined CTLA-4 and PD-1 agents. She had at that stage Cushing's disease. And then later on, she developed the, the tumor regressed and she developed severe cortisol deficiency. Click, please. So this was spontaneous regression of this mass lesion, loss of Cushing's, which was transient, and the development of ACTH deficiency. So these doctors were able to see the progression from hormone excess to hormone deficiency. Next slide, please. So early recognition and appropriate management is essential. And that's why in UK, they have produced guidelines, acute management of endocrine complications of checkpoint inhibitor therapy published this year in Endocrine Connections. So you can have life-threatening unwell patients with low cortisol deficiency, primary or secondary, with thyroid storm, that has been published, and with insulin deficient state ketoacidosis. And then next click, please. You can have mild unwell patients where you, whom you screen and you see low cortisol, thyroiditis, and hypothyroidism, but much mild to moderate. And these guidelines have now given us some advice more in details. Next slide, please. So the diagnosis is difficult, but we have to think about it and we have to inform the oncologist no, partially, because they refer to us because of low T4 and PSH, possibly. Next. We find low cortisol, low testosterone, and in MRI, we might find anything, no lesion or a moderate enlargement. We usually lack baseline MRI. Next slide, please. And in treatment, in the pathophysiology, yeah, the, 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 the question is, why does this occur? What happens? What do immune checkpoint inhibitors do? So I will show you a slide that CPLA4 antigens are expressed in pituitary endocrine cells and that the T cells uh, have a pituitary cytotoxic action. In immunology, they say this is type two hypersensitivity reaction. It's complement activation macrophages, you see that, and type four hypersensitivity action. Next slide will show you, next slide will show you how many CTLA strongly expressed cells exist in a pituitary adenoma under C? You see one uh, A, B, C, and in C, you see that CTLA-4 antigen is expressed by pituitary endocrine cells, particularly in a pituitary adenoma. Next slide will show, next slide will show in the B, under B, that there are macrophages CD68 infiltrating the pituitary, under C, that there is IgG binding to pituitary cells, immunoglobulin G binding, there are arrows, and under D, there is a deposition of complement. So the group from uh, US, Caturegli et al. have shown in the, in the American Journal of Pathology exactly what happened with the checkpoint inhibitors in the pituitary. Next slide, please. New developments. How do we know which tumors have CTLA-4 positive imaging and which do not? The Japanese have made a PET scan using copper 64 labeled monoclonal antibody probe, which enables clear visualization of CTLA-4 positive tumors. They hope that by this PET scan, they will allow selectivity of patients 
so that not everybody will get these very expensive drugs. Next slide, please. Guidance. Hydrocortisone is the mainstay therapy and should be always the first line treatment. Short synactin may be misleading if performed early. Steroid emergency card should be provided to patients. Next click. Hormone deficiencies may improve except for corticotropin. And the guidance is that immunotherapy has to be stopped and then continued once the patient is clinically stable and on appropriate endocrine replacement. Next slide, please. So critical. Uh, immunologists are not very happy about this happening to our organism, harming organism in many ways, not only through endocrinopathies. So they wrote an article in Lancet saying, hyperbole and promotion should not overshadow real work, further rigorous investigation. So there's a lot of promotion by drug companies and hyperbole. And although there is great promise in immunotherapies, we must not let excitement of such treatments overshadow the potential harm. I think this goes for every therapy, even in endocrinology. Next slide, please. I would like now to share my case with you, with chemotherapy and the pituitary. Next. A 34-year-old female molecular biologist with breast cancer, and I thought this was the case that I would discuss with you if I come, if I came, but since I'm not coming, I'll discuss it myself. And she had a ductal carcinoma, which was HER2 positive. She was treated with taxotere and trastuzumab, Herceptin infusion. Because she was a molecular biologist, she herself wanted the CT and an MRI of the head done. And look what happens. You see an incidental mass in the cellar region and normal anterior pituitary hormones. So what did I, she says, is this metastasis? I said, no, because you have normal anterior pituitary hormones. So what is the diagnosis here? The prolactin was a little bit like stalkly elevated by stalk section. So with here, well, you might have an incidentaloma, which is a bigger, a little bigger, or um, hyperplastic pituitary, but let's see what happened later on to this molecular biology. Three months later, after I saw her, she developed severe headache, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, blurred vision. She came to us because she was investigated for this pituitary with us. And I was sure that this was an emergency. This was an endocrine emergency, hypotensive vomiting. She had moderate pericardial effusion that was thought to be due to trastuzumab and low FT4 L-thyroxine also due to perceptin. Next click. So what is the diagnosis now? You see the pituitary MRI, and I discussed this with a lot of radiologists. And then I will click, I have to go faster. Next click, please. This is a pituitary tumor apoplexy with no, it's not hemorrhagic, it's infarction. On her septin therapy, she was completely hypopituitary. That's why she was so bad. We replaced her quickly. And uh, next click, uh, surgery was not possible because of pericardial infusion. So we had to manage her conservatively and uh, follow her through. Next. Uh, next slide. So she had worsening of the pericardial infusion. Uh, there was evacuation of the by pericardial synthesis. She received another new chemotherapy protocol. And this is the end result of her uh, uh, magnetic resonance. You see that the tumor vanished. It's gone with these um, interventions, either after apoplexy or after another chemotherapy. Unfortunately, six months later from this MRI, she dies from progression of the metastatic heart disease. So she had complete regression of the pituitary macroadenoma four months following apoplexy on Herceptin and Funk chemotherapy. Was, this was not a metastasis, I'm sure, uh, because you know, she became very well again and uh, until the next six months when she died out of her heart disease. You know that pituitary tumors harbor uh, EGFR receptors, 
and that the epidermal growth factor is important. And we have been targeting with Herceptin these matters which could have caused apoplexy. We can discuss that. Effect of opioids on pituitary function. Next slide, please. Uh, because it's uh, uh, an epidemic in America, we have to know this, that opioids are used for several purposes and can cause dose-related hypopituitarism. Amongst uh, the participants uh, is our famous endocrinologist from US. She can confirm that this uh, epidemic exists in US. And opioids may be used for analgetic uh, agents uh, um, in either intratecal morphine pump or any other form. They have very negative effects on fertility, libido, and gonadotrophin function through GnRH effects in hypothalamus. They also have hypothalamic negative effects on TRH secretion and on CRH secretion. Next click. Opioids are used for illicit recreation. We know that from many Hollywood stars. And next slide will show you some of the published cases and the reasoning behind why this is happening. So what we know is that opioids act centrally. They suppress hypothalamic release of hormones, particularly CRH. They cause a very, very severe signs of hyponatremia and hypotension. So these are the warning signs and symptoms. You can see a case report of an 11, year, 11 years use of intratecal opioids in a 40-year-old male who became totally panhypopituitary. And what came as a surprise is that patients with chronic diarrhea who use loperamid, which we frequently use, but not chronically, is the mood receptor opioid agonist. Come in this case report, secondary hyperadrenalism, and this patient could have died from loperamid use for his chronic diarrheal states. So we know opioids are very bad. Next slide, please. So now here, I heard and I saw your program, you will be hearing much, much more about the drug-induced hyperprolactinemia and drug-induced obesity. But I would like to end my lecture with a, uh, two or three slides on this topic. Next, we'll show you that, next slide, please, we'll show you that psychotropic medications there are two sides of the drug. One is to cure the uh, psychology. The other is, again, harmful endocrine side effects. So let me now uh, have a next slide to show you that we have studied uh, schizophrenic patients who were very well and who in real life were very stable and who received long-acting injectable risperidone, like long-acting lumbar somatostatin injections. They receive it on a two weekly basis, and we uh, followed them for two and a half years, and their hyperprolactinemia was stable, 1,700, it was lowish, it was not so high. However, we wanted to see in this particular study, boom, remodeling and bone mass and weight gain. And next slide will show you, next please, that there was no significant change in bone mass in schizophrenic patients, either those who gained weight, they were a little bit better, uh, versus control. And on the next slide, I would like to conclude, because this is a long talk that I'm giving now, that potential long-term consequence of asymptomatic hypogonadism due to hyperprolactinemia, uh, causing a slight increase in CTX, which we found, was counteracted by body weight increase and overall, no change in bone mass was recorded. And then I would like to end with another slide, please. This is a drug which is used for schizophrenia. Again, a dirty drug, clozapine. And next slide will show you what an endocrine disruptor it is. And I know Evie likes it. So clozapine is an endocrine disruptor. It's an obesogen. These ladies, particularly the one in pink, she got 40 kilos more due to the action of clozapine. And I will, my last slide, please, end up with telling you that my favorite philosopher, biological... My famous philosopher, Lin Yu Tang, 1937 said, spirit is a condition of the perfect functioning of the endocrine glands and we got bugs to rule this. Thank you very much for your attention.